Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing fine. <laughs> You're not doing amazing? I am not doing amazing. Uh, so, there was a bit of a question about whether we would even record this week, um, as I had a bit of a medical emergency in the middle of the week. Yeah. I mean, it's not life threatening or anything. Um, I don't know. I bet it felt life threatening at the time. At the time, I just wished I was dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, and it's not past. It's just, I mean, it's. But I, I. That's the other thing. I guess go ahead and put it up front. Um, I am scheduled for a surgery next middle of next week, unless something changes. Yeah. Um, and so we may not record next week either. Yeah. Uh, I say either because there was a I like I had some concern that we wouldn't record this week and we wouldn't record next week. Yeah. And we don't want that. Yeah, we have yeah. one in the can, but I, you know, thought that we would use that like maybe when I'm in Europe. Yeah. Next month or something. Yeah. Um, I was tempted to just fill in this week with that <laughs> and a, a little intro explaining why. Yeah. But here's your intro explaining why, and we're <laughs> yeah. we're actually live here recording though, so. Yeah, um, it may be short. Though. It may be a little shorter. We'll see. Yeah. See how you hold uh, up over I am, there. I am on heavy pain medication. So <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is going to be a drugged up podcast. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how all this goes. We're, we're going to get Mike at his best. <laughs> yeah, I r- ran into somebody at the ER, and I was, I was like. Why can't I ever see this girl when I'm at my best? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why, why, why am I always having a terrible day when I meet this person? Uh, oh, oh, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. Yeah. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. Well, oh, well. Water yeah. under the bridge. Got to pass. Got to power through. Yeah. So here, here we are. Uh, but we will be here for Thanksgiving, right? As far as I know... Yeah, I mean, you're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not I mean, going like, anywhere. We'll be able to but I've got I've got my hands full that well, I'm week. Sure. But um, but, you can but like yeah. take an hour away. Yeah, no, I'm not saying I can't. Okay. I'm just I'm just putting it out there. There's right. a lot going on. <laughs> All so, right, but there is for everybody. It's holiday week. Yeah, I hate the holidays. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> like I really do. It's always so stressful. Mm-hmm. Like just so many obligations and places to be. And I like a good routine. Like, I'm a routine person. Like, give me a good routine. I'm all about it. Yeah. Um, and holidays throw all that off. I got to get serious about got, buying gifts. Oh, yeah. And then there's that. Like, yeah, when, I wasn't even, like, considering that into the stress part. Like, just the obligation of being well, can, here and being there. You can pass a lot of that off to your wife, though, right? I mean, I pretty well do. So. Yeah. And, like, everything <laughs> except for her gift, essentially. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So... I got I got to take full responsibility for all the gifts I'm giving out. <laughs> yeah. I don't so get to just a, put my name on stuff. Yeah. I, I say that. That's not really true either. Like sometimes I get my mom to buy gifts for my nephews. Because oh, I'm yeah. like, I don't know what the little kids want. Yeah, right. <clears throat> but we got a list this time. and I'm, I'm List help. One of them I was like, yeah, I'm definitely getting this. And then I got I to gotta pay more attention to the other one. All right. Well, that was a, that was a weird intro. Anyway. Point being, probably short podcast, may or may not be here next week, depending on how I'm recovering from surgery, if I have to do it. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't even happen, but yeah, we'll see. Um, plan to be here Thanksgiving. All, all the others are normal, more or less. I think so. So, where do we start? Where do we want to get into tonight? Well, um, I don't know. I... Uh, I mostly, um, I didn't, I didn't get to, I didn't do a lot of news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this week, well, which is fortunate because <laughs> really neither have I. Like I've caught, I've caught some things, but I haven't had my usual regimen. I would say. Yeah. Um. Okay. So the there are like a couple of things though that I heard on No Agenda that I wanted to um to talk a little bit about that I just find kind of interesting or like. I don't know, wrong with our culture or <laughs> yeah. or something. So they spent a lot of time on the most recent episode um, talking about the weight loss drugs. Yeah. Um, Ozempic and Zepbound. 
Yeah, well, Zep Bound's the new one, right? Right. Yeah. Which is essentially the same as the old one, but with a different name so that they can track They can it track how better. it's being used. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whether it's being prescribed for its original purpose, which I guess was a... Um, it's a blood sugar thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, diabetes. Diabetes knows. related issues. And then it's been being prescribed off label for weight loss. Weight loss, yeah. So they gave the same drug a new name so that they can separate when it's being prescribed for diabetes related issues and when it's being prescribed for weight loss. That's what I understood that, from the clips how, anyway. Yeah, that's how I understood it. Um, but like, here's the main thing that I, I kind of wanted to talk about with this is, uh, that, that this is kind of what our medical system has fallen into is the, it, you know, it's like, it's the, um, analogy would be like, uh, oh, well, there's an app for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, you don't have to figure that out yourself. There's an app for that. Well, yeah. this is what our medical field is doing too. Like, oh, there's a drug for that. Yep. Oh, you want to lose weight? Oh, don't worry about your diet or getting some exercise or like changing habits or anything like that. Yeah. We'll just give you a drug. That way you can keep treating yourself terribly, but you'll still lose weight. Yeah. Lucky yeah. you. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, I guess we don't really know the long-term effects uh, of this either, but this one's gone through more. I mean, this wasn't like a vaccine, so it actually went through placebo controlled trials and yeah. so forth. So, um, I guess we have a little bit more confidence in the safety of this one. Um, but I just have a real issue with the, the, just um, the idea that that okay, just just take this and you'll be fine. Like yeah. you you would think coming from the medical community that it would be use these type of drugs kind of as the last resort. Like after yeah. you've changed your diet, after mm -hmm. you've done the exercise, and you're still not getting, which can happen. Like for a lot of people, you can do all of those things mm -hmm. and still not get to where you need to be. Right, and then and that that would be the recourse then and. Like judging from the clips, we because I, I listened to that No Agenda too, mm -hmm. obviously. And listening between the clips that we heard on No Agenda and just my personal experience with doctors recently, mm -hmm. like that doesn't really seem to be the focus. The focus yeah. is all right. Well, this is your condition. This is where you're at. This is what you need to take. Yeah. Um. And there there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of well, let's try the other stuff first and then mm -hmm. try the like the tough stuff first. Yeah. Which would be the, you know, changing the diet, the mm -hmm. exercise. Cause I mean, I'm going through that right now. And yeah, that stuff's tough, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's, we've given up on the holistic approach to health, period. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, like what you do, your behaviors affect all these things. And so, um, if, things are going badly for you, then maybe the first step is to try and change some behaviors. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if, or to help you along, we can give you some medication to help or so forth, but that shouldn't be the, you shouldn't be reliant on that, I guess. Yeah. And, um, it, to me, it just smacks of laziness in the medical profession. Yeah. Um, well, or, I think uh, that's a, a, just a disregard for the patient. Well, I think part of it, you're right, is just a laziness in the in the profession. But I also mm -hmm. think that the fact that the the pharmaceutical companies stand to make a lot of money here is mm -hmm. a factor as well. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, that's where a lot of this, I mean, that's where the stuff's coming from. Like, it's being pushed down from them. Yeah, but the, 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 the doctors are don't necessarily get any kind of benefit from that. Yeah. Um, I think that the the problem you run into there is that the professional organizations are corrupt. Yeah. Um, so your uh, American Medical Association or the American Academy of Pediatrics, or, you know, the, those those uh, professional organizations um, have been corrupted, and uh, since they kind of lay down the standard protocols for everything, um, and especially new doctors. I think, I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't had this experience myself. And, um, so if you're, if you're a doctor out there and you're listening to this, you can tell me, like, send me an email, Michael at the Liberty Mike. I would love to know like how this is going. But from the conversations that I've had with people with my own doctor, um, and so forth, there's, 
um, there's certainly a pressure, especially early in your career to conform. Yeah. Um, because most doctors enter the field, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and running afoul of the professional organization um, Ain't is good it, for you. Yeah. Ain't it, good is for it, the pocketbook. It's a quick way to end your career before it's really begun. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you still have this debt to pay off. Absolutely. Uh, of course, you know, if you make little enough money, you don't have to pay any of it now. Yeah, yeah but, but, the, but that <laughs> wasn't the plan when you went into the profession. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. The, the plan, plan was to make hundreds of thousands of dollars well, yeah. a year and that and yeah. help people like I say. Yeah. I mean you the the, uh, oh, the assumption I, would I'm, be I that they want to, you know, that that they enjoy doing this and that's something they mm-hmm. want to do. But and you it, you know, just like a um a business person, like a, an entrepreneur uh, you put up, you risked a bunch of money up front with yep. the anticipation that you would be able to make it up on the, on, you know, okay. like once you got things started. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that there is, there is pressure to conform, especially early in your career. Um, and that these are the protocols that are being sent down by the professional organizations. Yeah. Uh, I suspect, I don't know. I probably should have checked. I don't know. We're, we're kind of freestyling here, but, yeah. um, I, I suspect that the professional organizations, uh, also organize a lot of the continuing education stuff. Yeah. I, I know that when I was an EMT, I had to get a certain number of continuing education units every year to maintain my license. Yeah. I have to think that doctors have to do that too. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I would think so. I mean, I don't know, but yeah. So these conferences where you, you earn CEUs, um, organized by these same corrupt, uh, or corrupted. I'm not going to say corrupt. That's not quite fair, but yeah. I, corrupted professional organizations. So they're, um, determining who's coming in and speaking, what they're talking about, what they're instructing people or the newest methods of dealing with this, that, or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it seems like we've, like we've really gotten away from, uh, you know, actually, I, I, this is probably like the bigger theme is that you we've gotten away from kind of like personal responsibility for your health. Yeah. Like, you know what? Like you have some control over this and you should, um, you know, exercise particular decisions in order to improve your own health instead of just being reliant on chemicals yeah. to do so. Yeah. Which is something like I, I have a real problem with personally. Yeah. Like at least when it comes to my health, like I, that's something I, I, I am going to be in control of this, <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll make the mistakes I make and make the decisions I do. But yeah. at the end of the day, like, you know, well, yeah, I, now that it's gotten serious, now you're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm going to exercise some control over this. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I don't know. I, um, like my particular problem, like, um, that I'm having right now, I made adjustments in be- my behavior 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, almost 30 years ago, I guess now. Um, and you're still having yeah issues. I mean, it. but I was told, um, after the first couple of times I was told it's possible that this is something that just happens a few times in your late teens, early twenties. And some people get past it and never have a problem again. Yeah. And some people don't. Yeah. It yeah. becomes an issue that'll pop up every once in a while throughout your life. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not a fun issue to have. No. So, um, anyway, I, I just, uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I see the, the problem of personal responsibility kind of infecting culture generally. And yeah. I see it particularly in the medical field. Um, right now. And partly that's because I've had so much interaction with medical, uh, personnel recently. And there's now part of this is because it's so heavily regulated, um, that, uh, it's hard to profit Yeah, and, or it's become harder and harder to profit as a, uh, as a medical facility. And so they deal with that by increasing quantity yeah. And so you just feel rushed in, rushed out. Yeah. 
Well, I wish rushed in. You, you feel <laughs> rushed in and rushed out when you actually get to see the when, doctor. When the time comes to actually have the conversations, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you sit in a waiting room for uh, half an hour, and then you sit in an exam room for another 20 minutes, and then a doctor comes in and talks to you for two. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, uh, talk um, talks at you is yeah. What I've I, like I said, I haven't had that. My doctor's great, but like I say, I've <laughs> I've talked to plenty of people that like that's what they get. It's mm-hmm. not talked to, talked at. You yeah. Know. Um. My my primary care physician is great. Oh yeah. I I, uh, I don't allow them to talk at me really. <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm I make sure that they understand that we're we're in this together here. Like this <laughs> right. is uh, this is all mutual. You're not going to dictate to me. We're going to talk about. Yeah. Why this is a choice and if there are other options and et cetera. Yeah. Um, and like I have, uh, I have history in the medical field. So like, I'm not stupid. Yeah. Like you can even use fancy terms with me. I'll understand most of it. And if I don't, I will ask you. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's hard to take charge of your own, uh, medical interactions these days. Like you really have to be assertive about it. it, You do. Like I say, that's definitely a thing. Um, but my biggest concern is just the, like, we're we're just going to prescribe medicine for everything. Um, I I had a doctor at one point that when he got towards the, he had been really good, um, for most of the time that I'd seen him. But when he got towards the end of his career, he just started throwing pharmaceuticals at everything. Every time I come in with a, uh, like elbow pain, and he'd be like, "All right, have some antibiotics." Well, no, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. let's let's find out what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get to the um, bottom of this. Because he used to be into the diagnostics of it, and then yeah. he just lost interest, I guess. Yeah, something. That was years ago. That's not really exactly the same problem, but, yeah. um, but I I just see a, a real reliance on pharmaceuticals instead of um, trying to help people live healthier lives. Yeah. And it was the, the same kind of thing with the, um, with COVID yeah. actually too. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that became really apparent during COVID. Yeah. Um, when the answer was, well, you know, just vaccinate, like, don't worry about, you know, exercising and eating right and taking, well, even, making sure that you get your vitamins and, you know, all those kind of things that just help your immune health period. Yeah. Well, even before the vaccine came out, it was all like, stay away from people, wear a mask, like stay in your house. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't a focus on like, like becoming a healthier person, Yeah, which could have been part of the focus when COVID happened. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the, the CDC and some of these agencies could have took that moment to be like, Hey, look, this thing's for real. Like people should kind of, everybody should kind of get together and start thinking about your health. Mm -hmm. And, but that's not the direction they took it. No. So. No, it was like uh, here. Have these medications. Yeah. Um, we had this one that we we DC'd uh, treating Ebola with it because of bad outcomes, but we think we can apply it to this new <laughs> yeah. uh, new virus. Go ahead and take that. That'll yeah. be fine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing bad can happen here. Yeah. I mean, think about how bad the outcomes have to be with something that you stop treating Ebola. Yeah. Right. Oh well. Anyway, we beat that to death. Um, years ago so yeah and we were right (laughs) yeah like a lot (laughs) (laughs) yeah not on everything but i still have arguments with people about the effectiveness of masks with regard to covid yeah i mean i still see i mean i work with the public i still see people walking around with them on yeah I mean, that could be for other reasons. It could be. But, but probably not. I mean, I've worked with the public for a long time. It didn't see this before. <laughs> yeah. No, and the, you would occasionally pre-COVID, like maybe once or twice a week, you may see somebody in a mask. And it was usually the same person you saw last week that was wearing one. Yeah. Um, but now it's more regular than that. <laughs> so. Um, some quick foreign policy stuff. Uh. That was a real awkward transition, sorry. Yeah, but yeah. Um, some quick foreign policy stuff. I was just... Actually, you know what? Let's let's start here. I was thinking... I, I have seen or had conversations with people a lot recently and uh, uh, with you and a guy we know a couple of nights ago. Yeah. Um, about um, 
I don't know, sovereignty and property and, and so forth. And I've come to realize that, that a lot of people, even good libertarians, have a very statist view of ownership. Yeah. And there's no denying, really, in, in, that in this country you don't own very much of anything. At least in your major assets, you're really... Um, you're mm. you're paying the government for the privilege of use. Yeah. Uh your house, your car, etc. Um properties that you own like you know my bookshelves are full of things that nobody's really claiming but me. Yeah. But a lot of like yeah, major assets, major purchases. Yeah. You don't really own you you because you can't exercise freely the use of whatever those properties are. I can't do whatever I want on them. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, and if I don't pay the, like you were saying, pay the keep them, I can lose them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, exactly. They can be taken away if you don't continue to pay the government for your privilege of using your own property. Exactly. Um, but I, I have heard a lot, uh, with the Israel, uh, Palestine issue going back to the, you know, the old, um, propaganda of, uh, a people without a land for a land without a people, um, with the idea that, that nobody owned Palestine before the UN gave 55% of Ersatz Israel to, uh, to be a Jewish state. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the argument is, well, the Ottoman empire had dissolved, yeah. Or uh, the people that were living there, they didn't they didn't have a nation. Yeah, like the the ownership of property is dependent on some larger state. Like yeah. that, you can't have ownership as an individual. It has to be part of some kind of you know commune. Yeah, or right. something. You have to have a flag <laughs> or, or yeah. something like that. I claim um, this Pretoria. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I, it, the the argument I made the other night is. Um, well, if the United States were to dissolve suddenly, does that mean, do you think that that means that somebody could come in and claim your house? No. Because, well, the United States is gone. Therefore, that property is unknown, unowned <laughs> now. Well, and as, as witnessed the other night, like a lot of people do think that that's kind of like without a state, like then, yeah, it's kind of mm -hmm. free for all. Yeah. Um, and, and I, like I say, I, I, I don't agree with that, but that's, I think that's kind of the interpretation. Yeah. I, I'm kind of, I don't know how to, I don't it's, know it's how to argue like against it's, that it's, because it's, it seems so self-evident to me that, that, you, that ownership you still, is independent of a state. Yeah. Yeah. But if the state's not there to, to back it up and mm -hmm. like stand behind it, like I say, there's, there's a lot of people that would think that no, then, then yeah, then you don't. And it's almost like a, a mafia deal where like you have to have the government there and then you pay them for protection. Yeah. Which they don't do very well. Which they don't do very well. No, but they're protecting you from other governments. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of the idea is, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, you're paying for protection. So China doesn't come in here or whoever and, you know, take your property from you. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I don't. I don't agree with that. By the way, like I, that's not my take. That's just kind of yeah. Know. Well, there is a okay. So there has always been this this argument um, opposing uh, the ideal of libertarianism yeah. that I have a hard time answering. Do you yeah. remember the show The Unit? I do. I didn't watch okay. all of it, but I do like, remember it. Was about it. Delta yeah. Force um, yeah. guys. It was based on Eric Haney's book. Uh, inside Delta Force, which is a really fascinating book. If you haven't read it, it's it's worth the read. Yeah. Um, but there was a, a a scene where there was a, um, I guess, anti military protest near one of the bases, and one of the the unit members' wives went and attended, mm. and she made the point that. Um, that all agreements are backed by the use of or threat of the use of force. Yeah. And like, I have a hard time arguing that yeah. I, I, now the, now, I the point that I would make is that that may be true, but that doesn't mean that you, 
that you need to use force. It, and yeah. it, I suppose it, it's a real problem if you're a pacifist. I'm not a pacifist. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, the libertarian ideology is that you don't use force or coercion against peaceful people. Yeah. But if somebody's trying to take something from you, then you absolutely have the the um, moral right to defend it yeah. um, using force, violence, it, yeah. if necessary. Um, so while that tenet may be true, it doesn't, it doesn't actually just like, uh, um, in the I libertarian ideology, it's not, I'm sorry, I'm like really having trouble with vocabulary right now. <laughs> My brain is not, yeah. uh, totally clear. Um, but, uh, you know, it doesn't negate the, the ideology. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is something to consider that, um, there is no world without the threat of the use of force. Like there's, yeah. there's no ownership. There's no independence. None of that exists without at least the threat of the use of force and, and violence, yeah. um, to defend it. And that's something I've thought about a lot recently, mm -hmm. um, kind of in a different manner, but like what, what I'm trying to think of the best way to like phrase it, I guess, but like how force really works. Yeah. Like you have to be, you can't just, like I said, I'm, I'm having the same problem you're having, yeah. but yeah. Like, you didn't take any narcotics. Man, not that you know of. <laughs> well, <that's true. laughs> no, but just. I'm going to count my pills. In a <laughs> you might need to. <laughs> um, but yeah, just the idea of like force and, and like how it, how it's structured, like what, like you can say, you can tell somebody to do something, but you mm -hmm. only have so many mechanisms to make them do it. Mm -hmm. um, and even like in my industry where I like have people that work for me, yeah. like I can tell, I can run around and I can tell people what to do all day long, but I've got only a handful of tools to employ against them when they decide that's not what they want to do. Yeah. You know, and a lot of those tools come back to hurt me more than they hurt them. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can fire somebody. Like I can do that all day long, but I can't run that place by myself, you know? Yeah. Um, well, and uh, of course my concern about that, that position uh, about that all um, all agreements are maintained by the threat of the use of force yeah. is that that uh, that can pretty quickly devolve into might makes right yeah and that's kind of um, what peoples in a lot of places are dealing with now is that they don't have a strong enough state to defend them yep um, and they can't defend themselves against a state yeah like as individuals or even communities or whatever yeah um and so you know the essentially in the same way that there's no country in the world really that can defend itself against the united states if the united states decides to employ force to take what they want yeah um and uh and that's a sad state of affairs, and I don't know how to fix it. It's it, it runs into the same problem that uh, communism runs into, which is uh, an ideological problem. Yeah. That if you don't have people agree on this, on some basic tenets about how you behave towards one another, it all comes crumbling down. Yeah. Then it becomes just chaos. Yeah. So, um, just. Partly why I'm not a pacifist, but uh, I'm yeah. still opposed to, on moral grounds, I'm opposed to the use of force against peaceful people. Yeah. And the world would be a better place if everybody felt that way, but that's yeah. exactly the problem. Well, yeah. 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 You always have people that are going to want to take advantage of the fact that they have the upper hand. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, now we have in Ukraine, um, the U.S. government is reportedly... Um, now advising the Ukrainian government that they need to negotiate. <laughs> and I'm just going to throw this out there. Why do you think that is? Well, obviously it's because the counteroffensive is going so well. <laughs> okay. The, the counteroffensive is going so well that the U S government now feels that Ukraine is in a strong position to negotiate. That's clearly it, right? <laughs> it's not, well, that's not the reporting I've heard. Yeah. But, you don't, you can't do sarcasm on a podcast. Yeah, it doesn't something. really work. Does it? Um, yeah. But no, I mean, I think a, I've got to say, I think a big part of it is this flare up in the middle East mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, I think even as big and mighty as the U S is, I think that 
financially, they know that they can't convince Congress and other people to to fund both of these wars. Well, Janet Yellen You're, just recently said, though, that the um, U.S. government could financially support a two-front war or even a three-front war. Actually, yeah. I don't think she said that, but uh, she said no. two-front war, but, um, that we could and, deal with Russia and China at the same time, and maybe Iran, too. And and that's I'm sh- that's all well and good till the until you've run the money printers dry. Yeah, until like, it actually has to happen, too. Exactly. Um, and... The I think that a big part of it is just a recognition at this point that the amount of money that it would take to keep Ukraine afloat, yeah, well, is just beyond our capacity to maintain. And, and, and the I would truth argue is they don't have people. Well, I would argue that that was never like victory was never really the plan. This mm-hmm. was, and this is just my opinion, but I I believe our goal in all of this was to just weaken Russia, yeah. to to just. Throw, that we can throw money longer than you can, mm-hmm. and that you know we're going to bleed you dry in Ukraine. You yeah. you you made this step to go into here, and now we're going to make you pay for it. Well, unfortunately, industri- uh, Russia maintained their industrial base. Yeah, um, and so Russia has been able to churn out weapons of war faster than all of NATO, it seems. Yeah, um, and. Uh, and of course, the the real problem is that it became quickly a war of attrition, and it was a war of attrition between a country in Ukraine that started with fewer than forty million people against a country in Russia that was about one hundred and thirty five million people. Yeah, yeah. The bigger guy is going to win. Yeah, in an attrition war, the bigger guy is going to win, especially when they've got, you know, probably at least a five to one kill to death ratio. Yeah. And the people in power, even here in the U.S., they always knew this. Like they, I mean, they would go on TV and talk about, you know, we've got to stop them here and the fight for democracy. But mm. all of that was always crap. Like that was never what was really going on here. Speaking of the fight for democracy, you did see that Zelensky said that they will not be holding elections next year. Oh, I did not see that. Oh, yeah. Well, he said that they would not be holding elections next year unless the West paid for them. Oh yeah, we got we got actually, we got to pick up that us, tab. If you send us money, then then we'll hold elections. Then we'll but, hold fraud elections. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> One guy on the ballot. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, uh, I you know I think I think that you're wrong there. Actually, I think okay. that there were a lot of um, U.S. officials that were totally self deluded. You think so? Yeah, they really believed that if we I just s- sent enough weapons to Ukraine, that, that they could pull that, us out. Yeah, that they could defend themselves against poor old Russia, because you know <sighs> Russia, they're you, they're not caught up with the rest of the world. They can't compare to to Western, you know, NATO and U.S. weaponry. Like their stuff will never hold up. Yeah, uh, you may be right about that. I just can't imagine somebody with with the knowledge that the more knowledge about the 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 situation than me looking at it and being like oh we got this yeah and this is another thing where like the status paradigm kind of breaks down is that um the idea that uh ukraine has to maintain the borders that it claims yeah um even going so far as to saying that the people that live in those places they don't get any say in this yeah yeah uh, which is an argument that I ran to ran into quite a bit when I started confronting people with the um, the plebiscites in um, in the Donbass regions in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, no. um, where huge majorities of the population, like eighty five to ninety five percent of the population, was voting to join Russia. Yeah, and um, you know the first thing is well fraud elections whatever. Okay, so but the first of those elections were or those uh, plebiscites were held in 2014, 2015. Yeah. Um, and uh, and Russia refused to accept them. Yeah. A, <laughs> as part of the Russian Federation. Yeah. At the time, um, <coughs> and, and in fact, uh, Russia was pushing the Minsk agreements throughout, which said that they would be part of Ukraine but maintain some political autonomy. Yeah. The Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, the only territory that Russia claimed as its own was Crimea. Yeah. And that's another one where there, there was a plebiscite with like 94% of the population or something like that voting to be a part of Russia. Yeah. Um, and uh, so 
I, I don't understand, like, who has the power? I mean, are, are people, this is the question I would ask of those people. That, that support the idea of Ukraine maintaining the territory that it wants. Yeah. Um, regardless of what the people that living living there seem to want. Yeah. Um, is uh, who gets to... It, no, that's not, a, that's not how to ask the question. Um, I'm sure I have a better way, but my mind's a little foggy. Not, not sharp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's that uh, should a people be um subject to a government that they don't want yeah and then like and huge portions of a of a particular territory now you can say it for, for individuals maybe like yeah. i'm not happy with the u.s government but i'm i'm in a huge like a tiny minority um and so maybe as long as i'm here i'm i'm have I gotta to suck it up yeah but if a huge majority of a of a of a region of a, of a territory, um, doesn't want the government that claims it. Yeah. Are they obligated to accept it anyway? Well, the problem you run into with that scenario mm -hmm. is that you'll never have peace in those areas because if, if the government's being forced upon the, the people, mm -hmm. the people are going to rise up against it yeah, and continue to rise up against it until something changes. Which is why there's been war in the, in the Donbass region since 2014. Exactly. Because, because even like, I mean, those, those people aren't going to just sit there and be like, well, we just have to accept it mm -hmm. because when the nut, when there's that big of a, percentage of the people who are upset with it mm -hmm. enough of those people are going to take up arms against it and compare that with crimea that that russia did take in and that ukraine wasn't trying to claim sovereignty over until pretty recently yeah well i mean they were trying to but they weren't being successful yes they were being very unsuccessful and russia was protecting the territory yeah that's been pretty peaceful yeah until this war broke out in 2022 yeah. Even now, actually, it's relatively peaceful. Yeah. Um, but in the in Donetsk and Luhansk, who rejected the government in Kiev, uh, but Russia didn't step in to protect. Um, there's been uh, pretty much a constant state of civil war since 2014. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, if you say that a people is subject to a government that they don't want then yeah, you have exactly the problem that you identified, which is that there yeah. will not be peace in that area. Yeah, exactly. Um, and of course the, in, in terms of uh, the U S government now pushing Ukraine to negotiate, they had that opportunity a year and a half ago, right after the war began. Um, and they had a tentative peace deal and through Boris Johnson, the reporting from Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainska Pravda, uh, the Ukrainian um, newspaper, um, Boris Johnson told Zelensky, you may be ready to negotiate, but the collective West is not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and urged him to get out, and which he did, yeah. which Zelensky did. Um, now, a year and a half later, and who knows how many deaths, yeah. Um, and a tremendous amount of destruction within Ukraine. Oh yeah. Now the U S is saying, okay, well this is, I guess is, this is a lost cause. You better go negotiate. Well, yeah. he can't possibly get the terms that he could have at the time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Russia was absolutely ready to negotiate at the time because what they wanted was, um, their security concerns they were, addressed. They were, they were really just trying to prove a point, talking about Russia. Well, yeah, when yeah. they they were just trying to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table when they invaded. Yeah, um, that was the primary goal was to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table, protect the people in the Donbass from the Ukrainian government. Yeah. Um, and what they were pushing in the negotiations, the primary uh, point in the negotiations was uh, Ukrainian neutrality and yeah. to never enter NATO. Yeah. Um. And to uh, set Donetsk and Luhansk free, not for those territories to become part of Russia. They could be independent for all Russia. But to be cared. independent territories. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, to recognize Russia's claim on Crimea. Yeah. Well, now, a year and a half later, in untold deaths, um, Russia is in a position where it can't accept any less than the four oblasts that it uh, that it has claimed since the beginning of the war, which is Donetsk, Luhansk, 
um, Kharkiv and uh, uh, Zaporizhia yeah. and Crimea. Yeah. Um, and accepting them as being part of the Russian Federation rather than Independent. independence. Yeah. So, um, you know, instead of looking at Ukraine, looking at giving up as independent was like something like 10 or 12% of their territory, um, a year and a half ago. Now they're talking about not giving up as independent, but giving up to the Russian Federation, something like 22% of its territory. Yeah. So, well done. Yeah, right. <laughs> but we bled Russia, Russia dry, right? Like that well, was... I mean, clearly not, too, because Russia no. has a stronger military now than they did before. And yeah. Ukraine is, there's nothing left of uh, Ukraine. Um, yeah. They lost a huge percentage of their population, not to death, but yeah. to um, immigration, essentially. Like people fleeing Leaving the, country. Um, the territories. Well, and it's going to take for, I don't know, it's going to take a decade at least to rebuild the country, yeah. don't you think? I yeah, mean, and uh, huge infrastructure damage. Yeah. Um, now, here's something interesting, shifting gears a little bit. Um, oh, uh, before I move to that, I have a prediction about how this goes. Because uh, at the beginning... Um, it wasn't just the U S that was, um, or the, the collective West as Boris Johnson supposedly said, yeah. um, that was, uh, trying to prevent Ukraine from negotiating peace with Russia, the ultra nationalists, you may hear them called Nazis, but at the yeah. very least, the ultra nationalists in Ukraine were also threatening Zelensky. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, one of the leaders, I can't think of his name now. And I didn't write it down, and it's a Russian name that I can't pronounce anyway. Yeah, or a Ukrainian name. <laughs> um, is on camera saying that if uh, if Zelensky capitulated to the Russians, um, that they would hang him from a lamppost in the main drag in Kiev. Yeah. Um, and so... Well, I guess that's better than being sodomized through the streets. Oh, yeah, like uh, <laughs> Gaddafi. Gaddafi, yeah. Um. So Zelensky is between a rock and a hard place here. Yeah. Because if he continues to, to prosecute the war, he's going to lose. Yeah. And probably die. Yeah. Yeah. And At this he point, he's going to lose bad once the U.S. starts pulling their resources. Oh, yeah. And if he negotiates peace, his he's own probably going to die. His own people are going to pull against him. So yeah. um, what I'm afraid will happen is that he'll negotiate some sort of settlement because he doesn't really have a choice. He can't continue the war. Yeah. Um, and that he will be killed by the ultra nationalists in his own country. And that, that, that death will be blamed on Russia and used as an excuse to either further isolate Russia or to, um, to spark another conflict Yeah. with Russia. You think that the media and the powers that be can pull that one off? I mean, we've seen them pull off some stunts. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I wonder, though, if that can really be. Yeah, I think it can, especially um, the the way this country is moving in terms of controlling information. Yeah. Um, now, back to the, the death toll thing, um, because I, I found this interesting. I went digging up these numbers, which is in, through September of 2023, starting in, in with with the beginning of the war in Ukraine in February of 2022 no. through September of 2023, um, there have been an estimated uh, 9,614 civilian casualties in Ukraine. Wow. Um, because, you know, that horrible war criminal, uh, Vladimir Putin, is targeting civilians. That's what I heard. Mm -hmm. So um, fewer than 10,000 civilian deaths in Ukraine uh, in a year and a half. Yeah. All right. Since October 7th through November 9th, and just over a month in Gaza alone, 10,569 civilian deaths. Really? Um, including over 4,000 children. By the way, in Ukraine, the estimate is about 1,700 uh, children killed in a year and a half. Yeah. So in a year and a half in Ukraine, that terrible war criminal Putin has killed fewer than 10,000 civilians. And in 
just over a month in Gaza, more than 10,000 civilians have been killed. Wow. But we're okay with that because we're on the side of Israel. Yeah. So, That's not a problem. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's talking about prosecuting Netanyahu as a war criminal no. for targeting civilians. No. Just find this interesting little contrast. Yeah. Um, that's really all I have to say about Palestine, Israel right now. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I had more to say earlier, but I just can't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess the, uh, the last little thing is, um, our antagonism with China that came up in the Republican debate, uh, earlier this week. Yesterday, right? Maybe not. Wednesday, Maybe, Wednesday, I think. Maybe it was Wednesday. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure it was Wednesday. Yeah. Um, so let's start with this clip. All right. So in my first week as president. So let's just stop there and laugh <laughs> at Chris Christie, and then we'll oh, actually play what he had oh, to say. He thinks he may be president <laughs> one day. Isn't yeah. that cute? <laughs> I, I actually had to rewind it when I heard it originally because I laughed through the content. Um, <laughs> yeah. But here we we'll give him his chance here. To say right. what he has to say. <laughs> Let's hear it. We would ban TikTok. They want to go ahead and sell it. Let them go ahead and sell it. But I'll tell you another reason we would do it. Facebook's not in China. X is not in China. They're not permitting a free flow of information to the Chinese people from our social media companies. This is something that we saw a lot of during COVID too. We need to be more like China. (laughs) Yeah. China is restricting information to its people. So we should restrict information to ours. Yeah. That, that whole premise just blows my mind. Yeah. Um, especially just like you said, the idea that we need to be more like China, like, come Mm -hmm. on. Like, I mean, what we're supposed to be the freest country here. Like we can't, and we can't have TikTok. (laughs) Yeah. This is obviously a, a slippery slope. Um, this kind of relates to the personal responsibility thing too. Like we don't like the information that people are getting there. So what we're going to do is we're just going to eliminate that. Yeah. Um, instead of, uh, you know, I, I think that at this point, the primary focus of, um, a public education in this country is to teach obedience to authority. Yeah. Um, Maybe we should instead teach people to think. Of course, that's dangerous to a government. But exactly, your um, government doesn't want to teach people to think. You know, if we if we taught people to think, then they could probably suss out fact from opinion and determine for themselves what was true and what wasn't. Instead of just and well, instead of instead, we just want to shortcut it and only give them one opinion. That way, we know what they're thinking. And I will say this because this came up in our conversation the other night too. Mm-hmm. It is hard to find truth from reality sometimes Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of information out there and you've got you've kind of got to go through some of it to find out what's what yeah um and i get that that's frustrating and it is it's frustrating Mm -hmm. um but there's no easy solution to that like and what what's being proposed here in particular is is just dangerous much less i mean for one it's not going to fix the problem Mm -hmm. um and even if it would it's still not, it's still a dangerous solution. Yeah. Uh, because, and I'll tell you why it's dangerous just real quick too, is, and we've, I've said it a million times on the podcast, but when you start suppressing people's opinions and, and beliefs and stuff like that, like it becomes violent. It has no other option but to become violent. Mm -hmm. So that's not what we want to do. Like if we, if these people want to express their opinions, whatever they are, I mean, you agree with them or not, but they have the right to express them. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I hear from people a lot is, um, well, uh, kids in China are seeing, um, um, cello solos and, and, you know, educational content and kids in the U S are seeing, uh, scantily clad girls dancing or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I say, okay, like I understand the concern about that, but, like the algorithm set up in a certain way. Don't you think that it's possible? And I, yeah, I might be wrong. I mean, it, it may be designed that way. China may be pushing particular kinds of information to hits yeah. people and 
different kinds of information to Americans or Westerners or whatever. Yeah. But isn't it also possible that the cultural differences is what dictates that? Yeah. That. Americans are seeing what they want to see and Chinese are seeing what they want to see. Yeah. And I'm no expert on all of this, but I know, um, on no agenda, they talked about this a while mm -hmm. back, like the last time this came up mm -hmm. and that the, the algorithms that TikTok tends to use seems to be one that it shows you what you want to see. Yeah. Like it, it just, it, if whatever you're kind of into, it's going to build you an echo chamber of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and like I said, I'm no expert on all of that, but I mean, it seems to bear out like the people, like a lot of people are in the TikTok, and it seems to be that that's the reason why is they just get fed all of this stuff that they want to see. Yeah. You know? I mean, it is possible that the Chinese culture, um, instills more of a drive to, uh, accumulate information or skills or whatever to its people yeah. where the American culture at this point just don't. Yeah. Is, is about uh, entertaining yourself. Yeah. And, and speaking of which, like I get it. Like, I mean, I get on um, social media and stuff for, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what I'm there for. Like a little yeah. bit of an escape here and there, yeah. you know? So I'm not, I'm not even trying to, to like just um, say it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's a great thing, but I mean, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. It depends on how much time you spend. That's and that's really what it boils down to. Um, um, so the, this did continue, though, uh, with everybody expressing how they wanted to, um, how they were going to punish China or whatever. Yeah. And I'm not playing the clip because he's boring. But um, then DeSantis said that he would, uh, you know, bring the fight to China um, militarily, economically, or at least prepare yeah. um, a fight with China militarily, economically, and culturally. And I thought... <laughs> Um, do you have any idea what you're saying about, uh, bringing the fight to China economically? Yeah. And then I, I remember, so, uh, John Mearsheimer, um, the, the foreign policy guy that we, that we cite a lot, mm. um, the realist foreign policy guy, he, uh, made a comment about how before world war one, um, there was economic exchange between all these nations that were later, like not in too long a period of time, all at war with each other. Yeah. Um, calling into question the, the Bastiat statement about, I mean, he did say rarely, but the, the, the statement is where goods cross borders, armies rarely do. Yeah. But armies did in this case, even though goods had been crossing borders before. Yeah. And, but what Mearsheimer said about this, um, is that, uh, that security concerns always end up trumping economic prosperity. Yeah. And I, I thought, uh, well, that's because the security con concerns are a threat to the state. Yeah. And economic prosperity is a threat to the people. Yeah. And the state is more concerned about its own existence than the existence of the people that it governs. Yeah. Well, there's probably something to that. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, like any kind of economic war with China would be devastating to the well, our, prosperity in this country. I was going to say, our um, economies are so entwined at this point. Like mm -hmm. there's no, like it, it, we can do stuff to hurt China, but they can do, even the stuff we do to them is going to hurt us just as much, even without them retaliating. Yeah. Can you imagine uh, the economy in this country if we cut off import of Chinese goods? We would be decimated. Yeah. I mean, it would be... Probably literally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, it's back to that, uh, whatever that statement was about um, um, economic wars are just about how many of my own people can I kill. Yeah. Uh, we're going to kill 5% of our population if you don't stop this. Well, if you do that, <laughs> then we're going to kill 10% of our population. You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's the uh, the outcome of economic war. Yeah. Which, I mean, and, and to put the shoe on the other foot, too, like if we stopped buying stuff from China, it would destroy China's economy, too. So, I mean. To a degree, but they would still have stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like they true. would have the actual wealth. Yeah. They wouldn't have the paper anymore, but they would have the wealth. What yeah. we're doing right now with China 
is that we're giving them worthless paper in exchange for actual things. Yeah. Cheaply made things, but still things. Yeah, but things. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the things have more value, frankly, than the paper. Yeah. Um, That's true. All else being equal. Yeah. No. You know, I'd rather have the things than the paper. Yeah. Than Absolutely. the representation of wealth. I'd rather have the wealth than the representation of wealth. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Um, I guess that's all I have. And we've been going for a while and I'm like, <laughs> <Feeling> I'm, <laughs> I'm having trouble focusing. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and wrap it up. We, uh, will try to put out a podcast next week. Um, it just depends on what kind of state I'm in after surgery. If, if yeah. I end up going through the surgery. Yeah. So, or we may skip next week and you'll hear from us again on Thanksgiving. Well, if nothing else, like I said, I'll throw something on the Facebook page and let people know. Okay. okay. Up or down as far as if we're recording. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. Well, um, hopefully we'll be back here next week. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Um, like and share, comment, uh, leave reviews, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, if, if there's people in the medical profession out there listening that um, that think I'm was way off at, on our commentary at the beginning that I barely remember what we said, <laughs> um, let me know. I'm interested. And let, let uh, us know if we were way on too. Yeah, I, I would kind of like to know if I <laughs> if yeah if we nailed it. Yeah. Um, because I I, I I especially like to know when I'm right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thought you might. <laughs> That, um, but I, I, you know, I, I like criticism, um, and you know, constructive criticism is, is greatly appreciated. So, and uh, insight, like I say, yeah, um, definitely like to, yeah, uh, boot, I'm, boots I'm on an the ground outsider is on in, this now. Yeah. Boots on the ground is important. Uh, there was a time that wasn't always true, but now I'm an outsider yeah. on this. Um, so, uh, yeah, all of those things, um, like, and share, tell your friends, uh, all these interactions help us, um, help the al algorithm find us. I don't know what has happened on YouTube. Uh, we had a fair number of views and then it dropped off to like almost nothing really suddenly. Yeah. So I don't know what that's, happened. That's the algos, man. There. Um, so Maybe particularly on YouTube, go throw a thumbs up or yeah. something. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Yeah. Bail us out of the algorithm jail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't even get any notices that we had, uh, you know, violated community guidelines or whatever the stupid things are <laughs> if we if we mention the wrong wrong topic. So I don't know yeah. what it was. Um but anyway, uh, hopefully we'll be back next week. Otherwise, we'll see you at Thanksgiving. And in the meantime, um, I don't know. What do I usually say here? In the, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, sometime, come back sometime when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.